Okay, we are ready. Thank you once again. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rashi, for the introduction. Does everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so perhaps people could switch their videos on because I'm giving this talk for you. So I kind of like to see the audience and there will be time for questions in the end. So I think there's an hour and the presentation is maybe, I mean, it's gonna be short enough to ask questions, okay? So we, I introduce you to this research to just sort of show off what we're doing in our lab. The, let me see, where is the, let's get the share screen, go share screen. Okay, so now. Okay, all right. Okay, the group, our group is an interdisciplinary group between cryospheric sciences, that's the science of snow and ice, named after some kind of a Greek god called cryos, way back when there was a lot of ice around probably. And the work we do is situated between satellite remote sensing, new instrumentation, new mathematics, and developing computer science algorithms that facilitate analysis based on satellite data collected with new technology. And the thing is typically engineering likes to say they had the game, they have all this advanced, technology available and then the mathematical and computational side tends to lag behind a decade or a generation or whatnot. And so what we're trying to do here is to actually create new mathematics. So the core of what I'm showing you is a totally new algorithm suite, which is the basis of an infrastructure we've made that actually is utilized at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and creates the operational products for this satellite mission. So I gave the talk this applied title for racing glaciers, they actually search glaciers, but people never know what that is. Forest fires, melting ice to new NASA satellite missions. Computer science innovations motivated by data drive driven real world problems. The talks co-authored by some folks in our lab, Adam Hayes, Huilin Han, Tom Trano, Haley Gelaki, most of which are actually in computer science. Okay, so what you see in the background here is actually a surging glacier and a surging glacier is a glacier that goes for a hundred of years in the case of this one at a normal velocity, which is something like three centimeters a year and suddenly it bursts into going 220 meters a day, not a year. And you don't need a degree in physics. Do you see the mouse? Anyone see the mouse? Cool. Yeah, you do, don't need a degree in physics to see where the action is. It's here where all these crevasses are. You can back this up by saying, okay, there's climate change. There is the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, which says these sort of misbehaving glaciers cause the largest source of uncertainty in sea level rise assessment which is to say everyone knows the climate's getting warmer, the ice is melting, but these glaciers actually accelerate and push forward. They're not going back. And that's some complicated piece of physics. And the events are moderately rare, but when they happen, the glaciers push something like 1% of the entire global annual sea level rise into the ocean from just a single glacier. So now here is sort of the overview of this talk. I already covered this glacial acceleration, which is glacier speeding up, right? Is the largest source of uncertainty in sea level rise assessment. And there are different types of glaciers going fast. Then we'll get to NASA's ISA-2 mission, finally to the core of the thing. What do we actually make algorithms for? What do we code up? And then some applications and last, how we want to do the cyber infrastructure that's behind all this. Okay, um, no such large work is done without a lot of collaborators to think. So these include people in Svalbard who help with the field work and people at the University Center in Svalbard, which is 
an autonomous province of Norway, some folks from UNAFCO Boulder, and so forth. Also the ISAT-2 science team at Goddard, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and people from our group, okay? And then bunches of funding, which you could read at our leisure. The only important thing about funding is we have funding, we can pay you, okay? All right, so now a little bit of background on the glaciology that's involved. So you can see in the middle, you see this glacier in Svalbard, Nekribrien, as it goes forward real fast. And you can see in the background, there is really smooth ice. And everyone learns in, in calc class, right? The earth is indefinitely often differentiable, but it's actually not. Like this area of fractures is far from what normal calculus teaches you. So that means you probably need some different type of math than calculus of differentiation, which was a good thing in the 19th century and still around, but it doesn't sort of solve everything. That doesn't say we hate calculus, it's just not like the universal solution. And then on the right is a different type of glacier in Greenland, and it kind of has a different pattern. We'll just leave it at that. And in the left is a glacier in Alaska. So now the second row is image data from satellites. They're really, really high resolution data from small sets. And so we had some small sat company, Planet, collect this data for us. And the bottom shows the photons from ISAT2. And we get to what this is later. I have a few little videos. So first, here's the slideshow. Definitely the area is beautiful, but that can be after you set out pouring rain for, for two weeks straight, you can finally get in the helicopter and do service, which are airborne service of the area. You do see here's the fast moving ice, right? And here's the slow moving ice. No physics degree needed to see where the action is. Then you see all these icebergs which flow into what's a branch of the Arctic Ocean. So the whole show is just a thousand kilometers from the North Pole. So it's kind of far away and cold. These are some background infos about Nikribrien, which is the search glacier. And it last searched in 1935, 1936. So it's almost a hundred years ago. I mean, more like 85, but there is no modern data on this whole thing. This is from a different search glacier in Alaska. And this is a glacier in Greenland, which always goes fast, but not quite as fast. Okay, and so here you see like the problems we are up against, we'll have data over these really complex surfaces. And if you look further up the glacier, you can, all you can actually see is, there is not just chaos. You can see like areas that are close together tend to have sort of the same patterns. And that's a property we use, for instance, in an image classification to figure out where we are on the glacier or what type of actually ice dynamics controls it. This is just to give you an idea. You see really like these crevasses have just opened. So the search is sort of a sudden event, okay? All right, so then there are more pictures which sort of show what happens as time goes on. One can also use velocity. Like I said, the ice moves really fast, right? So the primary thing is to look at velocity from Sentinel-1 is a European satellite. And you see like this left one, there is, that's made for July 2017. So first there's a small part of the glacier that accelerates. And then the acceleration sort of spreads throughout the entire glacier system. So then here in 2019, two years later, we see the fast moving area has grown bigger while the absolute velocity has gone down somewhat, but it's still definitely surging. All right, so now to our satellite. So for the satellite, NASA builds satellites and then they form what's called a science team. So the science team is a group of investigators, professors, people at NASA and scientists who provide either algorithm or science or sort of mission advice to 
the satellite mission. So I'm on the science team for NASA ISAT 2 and also now for a different mission called CloudSat Calypso. Okay, so now, since you don't know what ISAT 2 is, is it not hopping? Oh no. That's what I said about, okay. Zoom does not play nicely with everything. Okay, now where's the share? Do you still see the entire screen or not? Okay, you may have to make do with this little thing. 1,387 different orbit paths every 91 days by ISAT-2. The orbit pattern creates a dense grid over the poles, all anchored here at the Greenland Summit Observatory. Since each orbital path will repeat every three months, scientists will be able to observe ice changing between seasons. The more frequent measurements of the polar regions will give us a more detailed look at retreating glaciers, melting ice sheets, and thinning sea ice, and the global impacts of those changes. All right, and it's as if this wasn't enough, here's another one. 0 0.2 micro radians. That's the angle of hey, pointing Vsauce. stability of the Michael Atlas here. laser. This if you place a silver dollar 28 miles away from Atlas, is Earth. the laser's center and would stay on the cruise the surface. Of Mars. That kind of stability and is absolutely is critical Earth for the spacecraft to measure the height of Earth from orbit. Here's an image taken only to ensure pointing stability, Atlas uses the beam the steering mechanism, blue which is a motorized marble. mirror that moves to compensate for thermal changes that happen in orbit and prevents the Atlas beams from bending as they head for Earth. Something bribed our video. Okay, back to the talk. Back to slideshow. Right, do you see the talk again? Yes, right. Okay, so what you were supposed to see is that ISA2 has three different beams, three different pairs of beams actually. So it's not an imager, it's an altimeter. It measures height of the planet by sending out what's called a micropulse. So it's a micropulse photon counting multi-beam laser altimeter. You gotta let this melt in your mouth or say it three times. What's the difference to like older technology, which is called um, pulse limited altimetry, pulse limited sort of goes boom, boom, big long senses to the earth, which then reflect from the earth. Now the micro pulses go at a pulse repetition frequency of 10 kilohertz. Blip, 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 blip. And then the sensor records returns from every single photon in the 532 in the green light range of the sensor. And that leads to a set of lots of discrete points. And if you look outside of the window on a sunny day, there are photons out because that's all the light you see, the blue sky and so forth. And a whole bunch of that is green light, right? So finding those returns, which come from the active remote sensing signal is an ill post mathematical and computational problem. So that's what we're up against. Now, Altimetry is not new. See, the first one was launched in 1985. It was pretty lame, but at the time people thought it was really cool. Then there's the European Space Agency's ERS-1 and so forth. Currently there's Cryosat-2, which is still going strong. It's also an ESA satellite and so forth. So here is a bit of info about ISAT-2. I think I already said some of this. It operates in 532 nanometer, which is green light. It has these sets of beams and it has a nominal long track spacing of 70 centimeters from an orbit altitude of almost 500 kilometers above the earth. So it provides potentially this really high resolution information of the earth. Okay, so now here's our, I have to do these like that, so they launch. Here's our last video, which gets us closer to the computational problem. 532 nanometers. That's the wavelength of a bright green color, the color of the Atlas lasers measuring the elevation of the Earth below. When Atlas receives the photons back from Earth, 
it has to filter out the sunlight that naturally reflects off the Earth, which would overwhelm the detectors. So Atlas only lets in light that is exactly 532 nanometers. Sunlight in that wavelength range will also set off Atlas detectors. And so computer programs are needed to filter out those sunlight photons in the data. There we go, finally. So we've made it to computer science. So now let's see what we can do. We go back to actually viewing this. All right, no more videos, I promise. Okay, so ISA2 has various objectives. What's this? Including glaciers, as you've already seen, and we saw crevasses somehow play a role because they capture ice dynamics and atmosphere. So our algorithm is actually used as the so-called operational algorithm for ISA2 atmospheric data products, which are an example of open source, open science, like everyone can download the Atlas II results globally and look at them. They are on the National Stone Ice Data Center, like NSIDC, part of the University of Colorado website called earthdata.gov. And a third objective is to look at ground under trees, which is an ecology application. Okay, so now first we look at the atmospheric data product. So we can see here in the left, we have what's the raw, raw photon. So this goes up to 14 kilometers above the earth. The bottom is kind of the earth. And you see a lot of nonsense or background on the right and less nonsense on the left. And then this sort of shows you how the DDA, which is the algorithm we made works. So first it creates a density. Actually, it doesn't show you all the steps. Then it creates a threshold function that's auto adaptive to background and noise density, so to background and signal density, okay? And to a thing called a parent surface reflectance, which is something that affects the satellite signal. And it filters out sort of the first order signals. There's a bunch of speckle, which we just dump using a clustering algorithm. And then we have some valid bins. And then we run this whole code again, which brings out the really thin cloud. So what's a thin cloud versus a thick cloud? If you read Pooh Bear, Pooh Bear has this black fat rain cloud and it brings a bunch of rain and it's really intense but when you go out on a sunny day or sort of right now you see some faint clouds which are tenuous level zeros there's not a prime example to see but there are clouds which affect the energy flow between the earth and the atmosphere and they're important if you lose them in models those are the thin clouds or they bring rain for tomorrow and if you go walking and suddenly one of the cirrus clouds move in it does get less hot, but they are super hard to detect in atmospheric LIDAR, LIDAR data. But so with the DDA, we can still find them and here's sort of an example of a thin cloud. Okay, so now here are some of the intermediate steps which you, you don't need to really understand these right away. There's a thing called, well, we figure out whether we can see ground. There's a bunch of technicalities for all this. The whole show is described in a 400 page by now document, which I have to write to just really describe the code in detail. Okay, so now here's a bit what we do. So you see, this is not the cloud data, this is the earth data. So you can see here's the earth, every dot's a photon, okay? The whole segment is one kilometer. And so now we need something different than waveform data analysis. Waveform data analysis is for these sensors, which went boom, 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 right? Okay, so now we transform the photons into a density space. Like we blow the whole show up by a, dim or by a dimension. Okay, so first we figure out, yeah, somewhere here must be ground, then we go above ground. Then we use the radial basis function which is described here in its mathematical form to calculate the density field. And then for each photo now takes the role of a center photon in this entire calculation. 
However, while the concept is kind of unusual, it is computationally efficient and really fast, which is why it can be an operational algorithm because the satellite collects terabytes of data a day. So it can't be slow, right? Then as the next step, we have an auto adaptive signal noise threshold determination, which does something like this. This is a function in the new density space. So it's not a height. It just decides, okay, the following photons must be background photons, the next ones must be candidates, and the next ones must be signal photons, and so forth. Then finally, we find ground for, and I have this grass picture in the background. This is the surface of, grass, of a grass area. The data are actually not from ISA2, they're from what's called an airborne simulator, because first you put the instrument on an aircraft, like a prototype instrument. You don't like shoot everything to space right away. Okay, so this is from Gavin Medley's thesis. He got his master's in math a while ago. And this sort of shows what we can see in the actual simple data. This is an example of glaciers on the west of the Greenland ice sheet. And here we can see how all the different channels work. So simple has a red channel in polarized and parallel and a green channel, which ISA2 actually doesn't have. And you can see how all that affects the type of signal. For instance, this one, the third one from the top has a lot of background photons while the other ones, not so much. Okay, so here's a cool thing every year, minus the last two when it was COVID, we actually do some kind of a field campaign, which brings us to the Arctic. So one lucky undergraduate in this case, some Bennett actually gets to go and on the right is Tom Trano, who's a postdoc in our group, who's done this for something like almost 10 years. And we are taking off in this helicopter provided by the Norwegian Polar Institute of a ship in a sound in Svalbard to fly over Nekrebrien to study the crevasses. So this is not a must if you're a computer scientist and rather sit at home in front of your computer, no need to go to the field, but there may be this type of opportunity. Okay, it's not for the faint of heart, but. <laughs> okay, so then here we have like the components of our work. We are mounting actually a small laser onto the helicopter which then flies at a different frequency. So we get validation data in 905 nanometer to see whether A, where ISA2 thinks is a crevasse, is actually a crevasse on the ground. So we underfly when ISA2 overpasses R in near term. And then of course you wanna see whether our algorithm is anything like providing a realistic output right? Or whether we are just feeding all this nonsense to the general public. We don't want to do that. So, and of course, it's a great adventure. I admit that. Then we have to do a whole bunch of geodesy to actually correct for, we can fly within, sometimes within a meter of the satellite overpass, but that depends really on the skill of the pilot. So on the left, you see a map of pre-calculated ISA2, what's called reference ground tracks, so we can fly relative to the reference ground tracks, figuring out exactly where the satellite overpasses will be. And then we fly all these tracks here. In the middle is a satellite image from SkySat acquired by Planet. And here, like we fly out for 30 minutes to the site near the glacier, then we mount, we put out a GPS station, mount the instrumentation and so forth. So here are some experiments we do and some results. Here is Connor setting up the station in a different year. He's one, another one of the undergrads we had. And the whole thing is also a contribution to what's called the Svalbard Integrated Arctic Earth Observing System, SIOS. They hold online conferences, especially during COVID. Svalbard has remained COVID free, but they've achieved that by actually not allowing anyone even from Norway for most of the time to set foot into the archipelago. And I mean, they're doing the right thing. They have a small hospital, but it's a five hour flight to Europe if people really get sick. So, 
but we can do similar things like next year. Okay, so here is the same show you had for atmosphere, but now for ice surface data. So you see the reflector, then you see the retent, the signal bin, the background bin, the density field, and then the threshold function in the end. You can see these are all crevasses. And on the right, you see if there's not crevasses, then you also don't get crevasses. So the algorithm is not a machine learning algorithm, but it's auto adaptive at several levels. Why is it not a neural network? Not because we don't know how to make a neural network. We actually can. We have other projects where we make neural networks for satellite image analysis, but you want the algorithm to run fast enough, but it adapts, for instance, to roughness and it adapts to the amount of background noise and so forth. There will not be a test on this. So you don't need to understand the math as of yet. So here <laughs> we can sort of see the capabilities. <laughs> Why are there fewer photons in one than in the other? So this is from a weaker beam. This is from a strong beam. So in the pair of beams, there's always one that has four times the energy of the other beams in the pair. And so now you can actually really see the ice surface and bunches of crevasses under ice. Here's some data from the validation campaign. And this actually shows the difference between our algorithm called the DDA and the current operational algorithm, which gives you these weird blue things. So clearly time to step it up at NASA and use our algorithm. I mean, they, they will, so. Okay, so now we can sort of see, hey, is this actually true? And you can go slowly but surely through this entire thing and find every point in this image that's also sort of a shoulder on a crevasse. Here's a comparison with SkySat. You don't really need to see all of these. Here's the same, so someone actually did that. Put like a point where all these points are. This is just to show, okay, we can match imagery and altimetry one by one and then do some amazing glaciology with it if we are so inclined. But most of our work so far has been about this detection algorithm. Okay. Kai is cooking. I can already smell the dinner here. <laughs> yeah, so this is a bit of a technical slide. We can just like avoid it. And here are characteristics of the DDAIs most of which I've actually said. Okay, so now we can go back to this primary slide and see sort of what we've learned. So we have different types of glacial acceleration. So now we know this one with the Turing search has all these crevasses with really sharp edges, okay? Whereas this one from an ice stream that always moves fast and has been churning away has different crevasse patterns. And so now for that, we are actually making a classification system that's a neural network. So Adam Hayes is working on that for his thesis. And that's about it. So to summarize, the DDA, so this is all about the DDAIs, but there are meanwhile tons more of these algorithms, like the CIS algorithm. The DDAIs is an order adaptive algorithm that detects crevasses and determines surface height at the seven centimeter resolution of the sensor over complex and of course simple surfaces. And so now we are able to provide high resolution geophysical data that we need to study really complex glacial processes. Like if you have lower resolution data, right? You can calculate, yes, at large, the ice sheet shrinks. And, and people have written science papers about, hey, we've lost ice. So yes, now we know exactly how much ice we lost. So that's cool. But what we don't know quite is what types of physical processes are out there that are to be blamed, say, for this ice loss. It's not just temperature, right? It can be dynamics or all sorts of things. And for that, we need these high resolution data. And we are currently running the entire Greenland ice sheet on the NASA cloud to demonstrate that we are actually able to keep up with data collection and make 70 centimeter surface detections available at the scale of an entire ice sheet. And so then this forms the core of a cyber infrastructure 
that. I mean, NASA is all about open source, open science, whereas there are agencies that have like secret science going on. You're not allowed to share very much to the contrary. Anything through NASA, you can actually, you're encouraged to share. So the DDA Atmos is the operational algorithm used for NASA as the two atmospheric data products. And here's actually how you get them. So far, so good, I think. Isn't there another slide? Yeah, so here are papers. If you didn't like the talk, you won't like these papers either. <laughs> Otherwise, you can read a bunch. Okay, since Rayshri will be sharing this, I don't need to say anything much about these things. All right, thank you all for listening. Questions? I want you to ask questions. Yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. And thank you so much for this presentation. Kai, go for it. I don't hear anything. I have one question, like you mentioned different photon types, like signal photons, and uh, there were different photon types that you mentioned. I think it was in the earlier slides. Yeah. So I wanted to know, like, how do you use the different photon types as your features? Like, how do you compute the graphs based on the different photon types? I know there is there was a threshold photon uh, signal below which you discard everything and above which you keep. But uh, how do you use different photon types in your observations? So that is actually an interesting question. Initially, when the photons are, do you still, do I still have screen share on? Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, so initially the different photons are undistinguished. So the whole goal of the algorithm is to like see here, the photons are not labeled what signal and what's background. Yeah or background is sort of a more general term for noise because it's not just noise, okay? So yeah. the goal of the algorithm is to sort the, uh, sort the photons. This must be a signal photon and this must be a noise photon, so to speak. And then you have them labeled, but before they are fed to the algorithm, there's absolutely no clue. So that is the main goal is to write an, a fast moving algorithm that's, intelligent, but it determines signal versus noise photons. And then once you have that, you can go and say, okay, now I make the surface, now I make crevasses, or now I make cloud boundaries and all the other geophysical features. But the detection problem is first, okay? Yeah, so they come unlabeled, that's the whole problem. But you mentioned you uh, you presented one graph where you distinguish the noise uh, photons from this uh, signal photons, right? And you like do the multiple passes of the same algorithm to get the clear. Uh... Yes, right. So yeah. in that image, like how do you figure out which photons are the noise based, like based on the data? Because you did some. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the algorithm has a component that actually figures out, I'm trying to find this, but it almost doesn't matter. So the algorithm has a component, which is illustrated here, that says this photon must be a signal photon, or this photon must be a noise photon. That's the, one of the main properties of the algorithm. And then the validation campaign is there to figure out whether we did this correctly, okay? The offset is adaptive, right? Like you said, the algorithm is adaptive, though that means the offset which decides the threshold is adaptive. Yeah, it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's an auto-adaptive threshold function, it's sort of stepwise. And it adapts to the biggest challenge is daytime and nighttime, because at nighttime there is no light, pretty much, a little bit, okay? So then pretty much every signal photon, every photon could be potentially a signal photon. It could be an unwanted one, like it could be a cloud signal and we are off to see the ground. And as you're an atmospheric scientist, so then you want to see cloud, not the ground. But then <coughs> as we move to daytime, there is a lot of noise, right? And so, then the daytime detection as well as this atmospheric example, you sort of see here that's only dusk starting to roll in. 
you have examples whereby I, you really can't tell where the signal is. Okay. All right, Kai, are you ready? How's dinner coming? You want to ask your question now? Else, anyone else is equally invited. Go for it, Aditya. Um, I have a question regarding why are we using photons? Uh, uh, why can't we use like a geothermal signature from the satellite instead? Well, thanks for the question. So the satellite does not record thermal signals. It records photon counts. It's a novel sensor that's built as a photon counter. So ISA-2 only flies ATLAS, which is the advanced satellite LIDAR altimeter system, okay? So yes, there are other satellites which fly thermal recordings and then you use the thermal signal. So it depends on what type of an instrument you have on your satellite. For instance, where you had the image data, right? Where did the image data go? More to the beginning. So like this satellite, Okay, Sentinel-1 flies what's called a synthetic aperture radar signal. And then you can process that into a velocity and it's a totally different measurement principle. And then you can have where the image data, where the image data. Smallsat, the smallsats from SkySat fly these high resolution images. Okay, and then of course, Optical imagery is the most known type of satellite data sets around. There is also no shortage of methods to analyze image data, such as we have a project to analyze satellite image data using neural networks. Okay. That's what uh, Jack Hesburgh did for his thesis. Thank you. Okay. Who else? You have to ask questions, because otherwise I will ask you questions. You know, once a professor, always a professor. You can unmute yourself. Has this type of research been done before? Is it unique or are other people taking other approaches? Well, so in a way, every scientist is unique as no science, but the DDA is actually totally new because it's a new mathematical method made from scratch. Okay, so I made this, the who actually asked this question because I didn't even see. I'm sorry, it was Kai. Hi, Kai. Glad you <laughs> finally you. got to your question. So yeah, so the DDA is unique because it's a new mathematical approach, which I made from scratch. Okay. And so there is currently no other group which develops the DDA. But like if you where to work with our group, you have this unique opportunity to work directly with NASA and help make new algorithms and so forth. There are other people making other algorithms. For instance, I referred to the official Adel 8 algorithm, which is the Landis algorithm that's made by Ben Smith at the University of Washington. But as the comparison slide showed, Ben's algorithm posts results at 40 meter resolution and our algorithm posts for every single photon. So it posts at the nominal resolution of the sensor, which is 70 centimeters. Of course, only if it's not such a cloudy day that we don't see the earth's surface at all, but then Ben's algorithm won't see it either, right? So there are different algorithms, but not like a ton. In this case, there's the DDA and the official ADLO six algorithm just for earth surfaces then there are people who make like inland water algorithm or ocean algorithm and so forth 
And so the idea with the DDA is to make it a universal algorithm and find a fine trade-off between auto adaptive capabilities or neural networks and like what should we do with just a fast moving algorithm where should we bring in machine learning and all that and that's sort of not trivial like a lot of machine learning methods have this one-off application so they work really well for certain well-defined little applications but they don't work universally depends Okay. All right. Uh, oh, professor, your current algorithm is uh, only adaptive for certain crevasses, right? Like not every crevasse is covered in the algorithm, right? Every crevasse is covered in the algorithm. Yes. It'll find, I mean, we tested that pretty extensively. The algorithm will find you any crevasse. It won't tell you which crevasse it is, but it will follow surfaces. See, like the two examples we have here are two of the extremes of crevasses found on Earth. And we've looked at thousands and thousands, if not even more, examples manually. And we've also run the algorithm around the entire world. So it is pretty well tested. Definitely this first order algorithm, which I showed you. This specific algorithm doesn't classify the crevasses. Other algorithms do, like one of one we're working on. Okay. I mean, I understand like people typically don't have domain knowledge in this area, which is why I spend a lot of time explaining that. But on a day-to-day -day basis, people in our group are just writing computer code and putting in math and finding new versions of the algorithm and so forth. But you do need a bit of understanding to realize what you're even going for. It's not a typical application in whatever business or whatnot or stuff that lives on your cell phone that I personally don't find super interesting, right? So people have different things where they can have examples, but these are examples from the planet on which we live. I'm not saying one is better than another. It's just sort of what some people find interesting and one man's data is another man's noise and so forth. Actually, okay. Okay. people have their hands up. Yes, uh, Rashri should monitor who wants <laughs> I will. I just sort of fill the gaps. <laughs> Akshit, go for it. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting professor, uh, presentation, Professor, first of all. And uh, secondly, what I wanted to know was that um, we are using this algorithm for glaciers. Can we tweak this algorithm for other use cases also? And if so, can like could, could you give us an example maybe? Yeah, so an example we've lately made is, for instance, the Arctic sea ice. So the sea ice is the ice that swims on the ocean and mm -hmm. near the North Pole. The entire area is actually solid ice in summer and in winter. But then in summer, a bunch of this breaks up. And then you see little melt ponds. So we've used it for melt ponds. We've also made this algorithm for clouds or mm. for shallow water bathymetry, which is sort of reefs and, you know, when hurricanes roll on, right? So we can track actually changes induced by hurricanes in the shallow submarine environment and you can see some right. of that so there's a whole bunch of people who work on bathymetry and right. some of them we just well a colleague called chris parish of oregon state gave a talk at what's called the oceans 22 conference presenting a bunch of algorithms and our work his work other people's work on shallow water bathymetry so which is to say there are a whole lot of applications I said sure. it goes around the entire globe. Yeah, right? that makes sense. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Pawan, Pawan, go for it. Hey, uh, so prof professor just wanted to know something like, are there any like uh, we thought it was a like we thought it was a glacier, but it ended up being like a wa like water surface, kind of a false positive uh, calculations on this algorithm, like. How, like, at that, when we are reflecting with the photons, right? Like, how do we know if it's actually glacier, which is, which we are trying to find? 
that what, are that are philosophy. Where is the false positive? What, what the false? Just say it again. I didn't quite understand everything. So we, I wanted to know like how are we are how how sure we are that we are actually like for a particular instance that we are trying to calculate roughness of a glacier. If what if it is something like in water or on some other land, other like water surface from the satellite. Well, so. In part, you do know where the glacier is located. Okay, so we've done some extensive work with geolocation. So you have the position and you do know whether you're over the ocean or over a glacier. Then where false positives could happen, they're not really false positives, is like there can be water on the glaciers. Okay. So mm -hmm. then that is a different type of detection problem, which is what I call a level two algorithm. So this talk admittedly only covered the level one algorithms because I wanted to keep it sort of not get it, have it get out of hand, right? So we have different algorithms that would make sure we don't confuse apples and eggs or whatever, right? Thank but you. the problem of false positives is a significant one. Yeah, thank you. Got it. I'll read about L2. Thank you. Great. Any more questions? Anyone else? Let me see. None. Okay, then would really like to thank Professor Oot Hertzfeld for her time and the presentation. Thank you so much. And thank everybody, have a great evening. Yeah, actually, thanks, Rajshri. I wanted to know who many of the students are master students and who many of the students are PhD students. So I think, how this, we, how yeah, the, I think this call has mainly all master students. I don't think I see any PhDs here. Okay. Yeah. So if they want to connect with you, it can be just directly email you. Yes, they can. Okay. okay. Sure. Great. Not many answers will be given within the next 10 days or so, because I have a proposal to write, but do write, sure, okay? And we do have job openings, which are under jobs at CU, like under student employment, so you can look. Okay, sounds great. Right, and if you just have general questions or want to read some papers or just see, learn more about it, I'm happy to send you some. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks for joining everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank Bye. You. Thank you.